so our next talk is titled optimal redundancy in distributed systems for latency and repair before starting the talk i would like to give a brief uh, bio of saraswati ramanathan saraswati ramanathan was an mtech research student at the department of electrical communication engineering at iis she received her bachelor's in electronics and communication engineering from Pre Best Institute uh, of Technology, Bangalore, in 2016. Prior to joining IIC, she worked at ITM Systems during 2016 to 18. Her broad research interests include distributed systems and coding theory. During her masters, she worked on the design of distributed storage and computing system under the guidance of Professor Parimal Parag. So, over to you. Uh, over to you now. I I unshare my screen. So I'm going to uh, present my uh, talk titled uh, "Optimal Latency in Distributed Systems for Latency and Repair." We'll first see why it is important to design uh, the distributed systems. Distributed systems are uh, basically a set of uh, multiple machines whose resources are pooled to perform a single job. They are typically used for storage and for uh, computing. For the uh, cost efficiency that they provide, and also for uh, preventing single point failure in storage systems, it is important to choose the right system parameters because they can impact the performance. For example, Amazon and Google loses up to 1.2 percent of its users to an additional delay of mere 0.5 seconds. So here we'll mainly focus on the design, uh, in the uh, optimal redundancy in a distributed system for latency as well as for repair. First, we look at uh, the impact of uh, redundancy on latency of a distributed uh, database system. In distributed database systems, data is replicated and stored redundantly over multiple servers. Here we have a picture of a distributed database with primary secondary architecture. This is a common architecture used in uh, commercial databases like MySQL, MongoDB, etc. So in this kind of system, a request to write to a file is first sent to the server denoted as the primary server which performs a write on the file and then sends this request to the secondary servers in the system. Once the secondary servers also perform the replication or the write on the files, it exists the, it exits the system and the, uh, and the write is considered complete. Since now all the servers in the system have a copy of the file, the read request can be served by any of the server in the system and can be dispatched uniformly at random to one of the server in the system. This results in load balancing. We consider eventually consistent database systems where read requests need not wait for all the servers to have the same version of the data and can instead read whatever version of data is available at that moment at the server. We look at the case where there is frequent and non negligible read and write in the distributed read write system. Since we want to find out uh, the impact of redundancy on the system latency, we have to see how the redundancy affects both read as well as write latency. The read latency decreases with increase in redundancy because now the read request can access the file from more parallel servers. On the other hand, write latency increases with increased redundancy because the write now needs to be uh, completed at more number of servers. This leads to a natural trade-off between read and write latency with increased redundancy. Using system latency as a performance metric, we will characterize this trade-off between latency and redundancy and obtain the optimal redundancy for the system. Before going further, we look at the prior work in this field. So downward delay in distributed erasure coded storage has been optimized over chunk placement and probabilistic scheduling policy in Al Abbasi's work. And also download delay in MDS coded storage system has been studied for different resource allocation schemes by Chen et al. in 2014. So the content download process or the download or the read process has been modeled as a folk join queue in MDS storage system in Goro Joshi and Badita's work. Both these works provide an upper and lower bound on the latency of the download delay. Badita's work also provides an approximation for the download delay. Zong's work is interesting in the sense that they study the trade-off between delay and staleness in a quorum-based distributed system. 
In Zong's work, they only consider the right delay while assuming the read to be instantaneous. And in all the other works that was mentioned as well, they only consider the read or the write delay alone while assuming the other to be instantaneous. To the best of our knowledge, we're the first work to study the system with a non negligible read as well as write delay. We'll introduce the notations that we'll be using, using the figure here. We'll consider a single file system with read and write requests arriving as a poison process of rate lambda r and lambda w. Since the read request can be directed to one of the n plus one servers in the system at random, we'll have the read arrival rate as lambda r divided by n plus one at each server. We'll denote the number of read and write requests at server i at time t as r i of t and w i of t. r naught and w naught refers to the primary server's read and write requests. Typically, these two requests are stored in different queues because uh, they may be served differently according to the priority in the system. So a priority between classes is what we consider here. Either there is a read first or a write first priority. So in this kind of system, when a higher priority request comes into the server, then a lower priority system will be preempted and the higher priority system will get its service. And once the higher priority system leaves the server, and there are no more high priority requests that need service, the low priority, uh, low priority request will receive service. We also assume that the read and write requests are served exponentially at rate mu r and mu w respectively. It must be noted that the write request first enters the primary server and after it is completed at the primary server, it is forked to all the n secondary servers and leave the system only after it has been served by all the end servers. This implies that the write process is an n and fork join queue. Taking the sum of the number of read and write requests in the system to be mn of t, we get the limiting mean number of requests as mn bar. Little's law states that the mean number of requests in the system is equal to the product of the total arrival rate of the request and the system latency for that request. Here, we write mn of t, mn bar of t, as a sum of the number of read and write requests in the system. Further, applying Little's law, we can rewrite it in terms of the system latency. We see that mn bar is a linear combination of the read and write latency in the system. This is also proportional to the total system latency, et, here. Since the limiting mean number of requests is directly proportional to the system latency, minimizing mn bar gives the optimal redundancy of the system n star. We'll find the optimal number of servers for read first and write first priorities. Denoting read and write load as rho r equal to lambda r by mu r and rho w equal to lambda w by mu w respectively, we only consider a stable system with load rho, which is the sum of rho r and rho w less than one. Uh, we'll first look at uh, how the folk join queue was modeled in uh, Ajay's work. So there they model a folk join queue using an equivalent tandem queue. Uh, we'll see how this works using an example here. Consider a folk comma forge folk join queue, assuming that the arrival rate for the request is lambda and service rate is mu. We have four servers here serving the right request one, two, three, and four. The request one has been served by server one, three, and four, and only needs service from server two. On the other hand, the request two needs service from three and four, oh, sorry, from one and two, and has been served by server three and four. So request three and four needs service from all the servers. Now rearranging this in terms of a tandem queue where each level represents the number of servers that has served the request, we have a tandem queue where the first level has requests which has not received service from any of the server. The second one has all those requests which has received service from exactly one server. Then there's uh, two servers and three servers and so on. The request will exit the system only after it has been served by all the n servers in the system, implying there'll be n levels here. 
we can see that the second level here is empty and does not have any request which has been served by exactly one server. In such cases, the server uh, resource can be pulled with the tandem queue, which has which is non-empty and which is lower than the current level. Here, for example, the request three is being served by both server three as well as four. Totally, we have the service rate for request three equal to two mu in this tandem queue because of the two servers that serve it. So this is a equivalent tandem queue system for the fork joint system that was mentioned. And we know that the total latency of the system is now equal to the sum of latency from each of the tandem queue. However, we, it's difficult to find the station distribution for this kind of a system because it's an NP hard problem. Instead, what we do is approximate the series of coupled tandem queues as a series of uncoupled tandem queues with average service rate at each level. So from the approximation, we obtain a closed form expression for the mean number of read and write requests in our write priority system. We denote them as f of n and g of n. We see that f of n increases in n logarithmically, whereas g of n decreases in n. This implies that there exists an optimal redundancy which will minimize the total system latency. This can be obtained by assuming the number of requests in the system to be a continuous function in n and differentiating it. From that, we get the close from expression given here, x star. And when it's not an integer, we can find the closest integer, which is uh, having the lowest value for the system latency as n star. Next, we go to the read priority system. In the read priority system, also it is similar to the previous folk join queue, but now the system also depends on the state of the read request. Previously, the write request did not have to worry about the read request in the system because we were reading dealing only with the write priority system. Now, for read priority system, the write process also depends on the uh, read queue at the server. In this example, server one cannot serve the write request. It can only serve the read request because there exists read request queued at it. Server 2 and 4, on the other hand, can serve the write request. And server 3 also can only serve the read request. We try to see how the fork join queue under a read priority system will appear if we were to write it as a tandem queue without considering the read request. If there were no read request, then the system would look something like this. However, in the presence of read request, server 3 and server 1 are busy serving the read request and are not available to serve the write request. So we'll have a reduced service rate at the tandem queues. It is also necessary to keep track of the set of servers that have served a write request because at any point of time, a write request cannot be served by the same server twice. It needs service from each of the end server in the system. So we will extend the state space to include the set of servers that have served the write request in the tandem queue. We define SK of T to be the set of secondary servers that has already served write request K at time T. The sequence of set of observed servers for all four write requests is S of T. We write the state of the system at time T as Z of T equal to W naught of T comma S of T comma R of T. R of T includes R0 of T, R1 of T and so on till Rn of T which is the number of read requests at the n plus one servers in the system. We see that the random process z of t for t varying from zero to infinity forms the continuous time markup chain. We give the associated generator matrix q over here. We have a system with infinite dimension state space and the number of requests in the tandem q i is the total number of requests that has received service from i service. So this is equal to the set of requests that has cardinality sk of t is equal to i. We write y of t equal to y naught of t so until y n minus 1 of t to represent the pool tandem queue whose service depends on the state of read queues in the system. 
and also the set of observed servers for each tandem queue. We approximate the Markov chain by a series of uncoupled tandem queues with service rate at tandem queue i defined as beta of i. Once again, we get the mean number of read and write requests in the system as p of n and q of n. We can obtain the optimal number of secondary servers numerically, and we can get the n star to be the value at which the total number of requests in the system is minimum. So here we have performed this experiment numerically, and we try to compare it with the empirical results that was obtained from the experiment and with the analytical results that we, that we obtained from the uh, expressions and theorems that was given earlier. We keep, for now we're dealing with right priority system, we keep the right arrival rate fixed and vary the read arrival rate within the stability region. And we see that with any st right arri read arrival rate, the optimal number of servers increases in this. This is because the write process does not depend upon the read request in the system, you know, write priority system. So increasing the number of uh, number of servers would be optimal to reduce the read latency, while the read request uh, arrival rate is increased. Whereas for keeping the read arrival rate fixed and changing the write arrival rate within the stability region, we see that the optimal number of servers first decreases and then increases. This is because now with increased write arrival rate, it is going to increase the write latency as well as the read latency because the read latency is also dependent on the write latency in a write priority system. For a read priority system, we see a similar behavior. And here also, when the read arrival rate increases, the optimal number of servers increases. And for when the right arrival rate increases, the optimal number of servers first decreases and then increases. We compare the read and write priority system. We take two kinds of system, one which is write heavy and another which is read heavy. This is a write heavy system, this is a read heavy system. In the write heavy system, we see that the optimal number of servers for a read priority system with write heavy load is one. Because when there's a lot of write requests, it is sensible to keep the number of n as minimum as possible to reduce the write latency. On the other hand, for a write priority system, even under write heavy load, first the mean number of requests decreases and then only it increases, meaning there is an optimal number of server somewhere in between. For a read heavy system, we see that both write as well as read priority systems have a dip in the mean number of requests and that there is an optimal somewhere uh, in between. However, we see that the read priority systems, the mean number of requests varies too fast, whereas for the write priority system, the variation is gradual and it is more accommodating of the over or under provisioning of the written servers. We plot here the mean number of requests uh, as a number as a function of the number of servers in the read and write party system that we obtain via an experiment on a seven server distributed storage system. This was done. This experiment was done practically, and we see that there are some variations in the ex uh, simulation as well as from the experiment. This is mainly due to the non-idealities in an actual system like the network delay and the non-homogeneity in a server. This exists for both read as well as write priority systems. We fit different non memberless service distributions to the distribution that was obtained from the experiment and see that there exists an optimal number of servers even for non memberless service in both read as well as write priority systems. So, this is a contribution that I made in this section. We analyze the uh, latency to redundancy trade off in a distributed read write system and no, under non instantaneous read and write. We study a Markov chain which is more complex than previously studied poke joint queue under the read priority system. So, whatever Markov chain that has been studied before had only considered poke joint queues. But here we're also considering the priority, and that is an extra or more an extra and more complicated system. 
We obtain a closed form approximation for the number of read and write requests in the system and empirically show that the proposed approximation remains tight over the entire range of system parameters in stability region. This work can further be extended to analyze general service distribution and also to study a system with network latency. Now we go to the second part of the talk. This, this time we're dealing with distributed computing. Distributed computing is a, in, a, in distributed computing, computation job is split into multiple tasks and performed parallelly over multiple nodes. So here we have an example of such a system. The master node will receive whatever computation that needs to be done, and it will send this computation to the worker nodes in the system. Typically, it is used for polynomial computations. And once a worker node completes its computation, it will send back the result to the master node that will consolidate the results and send it back to the user. However, it is possible that the user is interested in only a particular computation and still has to wait for the master node to consolidate the results from all the worker nodes. In such cases, it is better to simply uh, it's, it's better to simply ask for whatever computation it is interested in from what is known as a relay node which acts like a bridge between the master node and the worker nodes. In this case, suppose a user is interested in a certain computation, it will only have to wait for the computations in the worker node. This can only be done if we make the worker nodes a linear in computation of the worker nodes is a linear combination of other worker nodes from the same set of uh, rack. So if at all um, computation goes missing, the user can still collect it from the linear combination of the computations from other servers in the same rack. We'll first look at Lagrange coded computing, which gives the optimal number of recovery threshold for polynomial computations. Well, a recovery threshold is the total number of nodes that a user has to contact in, uh, in order to get the final output that it is interested in. The goal right now is to compute function f going from fl to f over k input messages x1 so on to xk using n worker nodes. The inputs are encoded using a Lagrange polynomial first u dash of x defined as u dash of x u dash of x of z equal to summation over k varying from 1 to capital K, xk, multiplied with the product of z minus beta j divided by beta k minus beta j. It must be noted that beta are all distinct values. Here, we see that u dash x of beta k is equal to xk. And this is true for all k varying from 1 to capital K. Polynomial u dash of x is evaluated at n distinct locations, alpha n, going from 1 to capital N, and sent to the worker nodes that compute function f over the encoded input. So the worker node n now has an evaluation of f of u dash of x at location alpha n. And f of xk that we are interested in computing can be obtained by interpolating f of u dash of x to evaluation locations beta k. Because once we get the composite function f of u dash of x, just substituting beta k into it will give us xk here and then f of xk that we require. Next, we look at another code called the Tamoba code. This is a kind of code that introduces locality inside a non computation case. We consider an evaluation vector gamma with distinct values which is partitioned into S sets A1 so on to AS with P plus one elements each. We obtain a polynomial known as a good polynomial with degree P plus one, such that it is constant in each set AI for the I belonging to one to capital S. Denoting elements in message vector A belonging to FK as AI comma P, we obtain the encoding polynomial for the code as FA of Z equal to summation p varying from 1 to capital P, z power p minus 1 multiplied by summation i varying from 1 to k by p, aip into g power i minus 1 of z. 
we know that the degree of G is P plus 1. So we can see that the degree of FA of Z is equal to capital P plus 1 plus K by P minus 1 into P plus 1 minus 1, which is uh, the total number of evaluation that we need for getting the function FA of Z. A missing element from the code word C can be recovered from other P elements. This is because we know that G is constant inside each set AI. So within a set, set AI, GI minus 1 is constant. And we only have to deal with the degree that comes from the Z power P minus 1 polynomial. And hence, it can be recovered from P other elements. Now we look at our problem. We have K input messages X1 to XK from input vector space FL and polynomial function F going from FL to F. N worker nodes each with linear encoding map Pn going from FL cross K to FL. That is, we are mapping a matrix to a vector. Each worker N computes F of Pn of X and transmits it to the master. A slow node that, that doesn't respond with the computation output is a straggler and the output from it is considered erased. We denote this as E. So the final decoder map at the master can be denoted as psi, which goes from F union E with dimension N to FK. And we decode F of X1 so on to F of XK from the received vector. Our goal is to design a computation scheme phi n so on to psi, phi n so on to phi n comma psi that introduces the repair locality into the optimal LCC scheme. So we see how we construct the scheme. First, we split the k inputs into k by p partitions with p inputs each. The partition evaluation locations gamma n goes from 1 to capital N. And we partition these evaluation locations also into S sets, A1, so on to AS. Next, we design an encoder function ux such that the degree of ux within repair set is lower than the actual degree of the ux that we have. Each of the repair set is corresponding to the evaluation set AI. So we see here that we have split the worker nodes into uh, S sets. These are actually corresponding to the valuation locations A1, so on to AS. And each of these block of nodes are the set of nodes that can be written who uh, a set of nodes whose computation can be written as a linear combination of other computations from the same set and that's why it's called the repair set because a missing computation can be repaired from the other computations in the set for each set ai for i varying from 1 to k by p we define subsets ai tilde of AI of P elements and a master function UI, which is defined as follows. It must be noted that UI is constant on the partitioning sets and also that it is equal to one or zero at the first K by P sets. Lagrange interpolation polynomial eta AI is a, as it states in a Lagrange interpolation polynomial for all the elements in the set AI tilde meaning eta ai of beta is equal to a beta in this case. So if, as long as we vary beta to every element in the ai tilde set, we can get all the elements a beta. Denoting the partitioned input vectors x1 so on to xk by p, we construct the encoding function ux as sum over i going from 1 to k by p ui into eta i. The repair locality of the distributed coded computing scheme described in the construction above is RLRL defined as degree of f into p minus 1 plus 1. And the recovery threshold for the same is TLRL less than or equal to degree of f into k by p minus 1 into RLRL plus 1 plus p minus 1 plus 1. This is obtained because we know that for 
RLRL, we need to get the computation only from a certain set of nodes within the AI. Within AI, we know that the degree of UI is zero because it's constant within each AI. Because of that, we only have the degree from eta i in the UX within our evaluation set AI. And that's why it has only degree equal to p minus one within the set AI. And since we perform the com composite function uh, computation of f over it, and we get the composite function f of u x, we get degree of f into p minus one plus one as the repair locality for the system. However, the actual degree of the system is different. If we were not to restrict ourselves to the computations only from the set AI, then the degree will be the one given in TLRL. We can generalize this to SL stragglers. SL is the local stragglers in the system, and then the number of stragglers that the system can tolerate locally. We'll modify UI accordingly, and we'll increase the number of evaluations in set AI to RLRL plus SL. And we get TGLRL to be pretty much the same as TLRL, with only variation that the RLRL plus one term is replaced by RLRL plus SL term. The RLRL still remains same. We have an example construction here. For input vectors x1, so on till x6, belonging to f31 of dimension 2, and n equal to 24 nodes, we compute function f going from f2 to f defined as f of x equal to x1 square plus x2 square while tolerating one local straggler. We partition the input into two sets with p equal to three vectors each as x1, x2, x3, and x4, x5, x6. From theorem 5, we see that the repair locality for the construction is r equal to 5. The polynomial g of z equal to z power 6 takes constant values in the sets a1, a2, a3, a4, and a5. So 1 power 6, 5 power 6, 6 power 6, so on till 30 power 6 are all the same value within f31. Similarly for a2, a3, a4, and a5. As we know that we are only talking about the field f31 here. Using the properties of g and ui from the equation 1, we construct u1 of z as 2 plus 30 into z power 6 and u2 equal to 30 plus z power 6. We see that u1 and u2 are constant within each of these sets a1 so on till a5 and also that it takes only values 1 or 0 at a1 and a2. Taking a subset of three values from these two sets a1 tilde and a2 tilde as 1, 5, 6 and 2, 10, 12, we construct the Lagrange polynomials eta1 and eta2. We can see that eta1 takes value x1 at location 1, x2 at location 5 and x3 at location 6. Similarly for eta2. We construct the encoding function finally as ux equal to u1 into eta1 plus u2 into eta2. The n evaluation locations for the encoding function are chosen to be eta n belonging to a1, a2, a3, comma a4 and a worker node n receives the encoded input ux of gamma n and computes f over it to obtain f of ux of gamma n. The output from the n worker nodes are evaluations of composite function f of ux with degree, degree of f into k by p minus 1 into r plus sl plus p minus 1, which is equal to the tglrl that was defined earlier. This is actually equal to tglrl minus 1. But uh, even if the degree is just minus 1, the number of computations that we need is plus 1, meaning we will need 17 computations. The computations from the node in a partition form an r plus sl comma r read Solomon code, while the output from the n worker nodes form an n comma t g l r l read Solomon code. The code can tolerate one local struggler and seven global strugglers, which is t n minus t g l r l in this case. We compare our scheme, the recovery threshold, with two known schemes that have a repair locality introduced into them, PLCC and repeated LCC. PLCC is product LCC, and repeated LCC is a kind of scheme where evaluations from the LCC scheme itself is repeated. Here we see that 
our scheme is better than is having a lower recovery threshold than PLCC scheme once the number of nodes increases. Similarly, for a repeated LCC scheme, we see that the scheme that we have proposed is either better than the repeated LCC scheme or at least equal to the repeated LCC scheme. For lower degree, our scheme proves to be better than the repeated LCC scheme. And as it moves to a higher degree, they both merge to form the same code. Here we have summarized the contribution, the second part. We introduce a repair locality in the distributed polynomial computation framework. We present a locally recoverable LCC scheme, which is based on encoding inputs using Tamubar codes with carefully chosen parameters to achieve the desired repair locality. We characterize the recovery threshold obtained by the scheme and compare the same with the recovery thresholds obtained by repeated LCC scheme and product LCC scheme. This work can further be extended to find the region of optimality for the scheme proposed and also to find more general schemes with locality. With that, we have come to the end of the talk. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Saraswati. Any questions? If not, then I would like to thank you from the ComSoc. I'll share my screen. I hope it's visible. So this is a, a virtual plaque from my side to you uh, for sparing your time and uh, giving this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.